Well, just making sure that the uh, microphone is connected there, Ben. How, how's that sounding? <laughs> I can hear you loud and clear, but then I could hear Melzi loud and clear last week too, because she was sitting right next to me. Far out. So let's address that elephant in the room. Last week, Melzi was on the desk, possibly the best episode we have ever recorded. Lo and behold, her microphone was not <laughs> attached. <laughs> it's actually rare too, because... Uh... Everyone was a little drunk, and usually when uh, everyone's a little drunk, you think you've recorded a great episode, and then when you listen back to it, not so much, but it actually was a great episode. It was. It was very well received, and just, you know, Melzi saved the episode because she's so loud and energized, and <laughs> you can hear her regardless, you know? She's so Melzi. I think that's the... Uh... She's... Yes. <laughs> and of course, if this episode sounds a bit different to people, that's because we are we are Zooming our recording this morning. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> this the, I love that I love that you after what uh, what are we a hundred episodes or whatever the podcast yeah you're still trying to maintain the fiction that we actually record at six o'clock in the morning <laughs> on a Monday morning and you're so intent on smashing it and smashing it yeah ah oh, dearie well anyway so you've got a lot of monster fest coming up so you're pretty spread thin at the moment and that's why we're doing this. Via Zoom, I don't mind either. I mean, you smell, so I'm happy. Works out well for both of us then. <laughs> well, hello everybody. Happy Monday to you all. Or if it's Tuesday, Wednesday, whatever day of the week, happy that day to you. This is Good Movie Monday, and um, this, is, this is some serious music to get us in the mood for the show, Ben. We're talking about action movies that you might have missed. Well, sort of. This theme chopped and changed uh, over the course of the last few weeks, um, from forgotten action movies to obscure action movies to I don't know what the fuck. Let's just say we're going to be chatting about action B-movies that you might not have seen. <laughs> yeah? When Ben is on Zoom, he misses his cue because he's like, he's just watching me. He's watching you, I'm camera. just watching you dig your own grave there. Like when you, <laughs> we changed the theme so many times so we didn't insult the guests. And uh, you just then you just <laughs> blurted out all the things that you didn't want to call the show to do it. <laughs> I, was, I was quite happy to let you just keep going. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> that movie of focus is anything but, but um, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, I hope that you're all primed for some action movie banter. Let's I put it love, that way, I mate. do love a good bit of action. You can grease me up and call me Billy Blanks. <laughs> Oh man, if you're a first timer to the show, uh, welcome. We are a weekly movie podcast dedicated to nerdy cinematic ramblings, and I hope this is going to be a fun episode for you. Um, Dan, like I said, if it wasn't a tough one to put together, because I mean, you and I are no strangers to B action movies, mate, but I thought this was going to be a cinch to do. I reckon I went through at least six movies before I settled on what ones to talk about. How'd yeah, you look, go? I, funnily enough, I, I don't, I actually, I. I don't know how I kind of did it. I think I just watched a bunch of movies and then five minutes ago went, yeah, I'll talk about these ones. <laughs> because, uh, like, I had I had a string of them that I, that I have watched, I don't know how recently, like in the last in the last six months, say. Uh, and I was like, oh, I could talk about that. I could talk about that. I could talk about that. And then I'm like, how well do I, you know, the, the Alzheimer's is really setting in because I'm like, how well do I remember... <laughs> All the intricacies of the plot. Like one of the movies I, I watched a, a little while ago was, um, I think it's called Running on Empty. Uh, but it's yep. not the running. The not, Aussie one or the American one? the American one. one with Judge Reinhold and uh, it's not Michael Parr. Is it River Phoenix? No. It's someone like Michael Parre, but it's uh, okay. it's not. And I like I watch it on VHS and it's a great movie. But apart, mm. I can't see, obviously, I can't even remember who the main guy is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, well, the, the funny thing is that you and I uh, were we guested on the Bonehead Weekly podcast recently. That episode should be going to air pretty soon. But they asked us the question, "How long do you guys put into preparation for the show?" And you've just gone and said five minutes ago you've decided what you're going to. Yeah, talk no. About. Well, it, well, I've done. I've prepped for the show. Like uh, for the, my entire life has been prepped for the show. <laughs> 
but like you like you watch six films right you only decided on what six films you're going to do what what two films out of the six that you watched i, I, I watched about yes yes i know i watched about you know 10 films in the last week kind of leading up to it but i only decided which ones of those 10 i'm going to talk about five minutes ago. Wow, you, you put in a lot of effort. We get it. Yeah. Like, we get it. <laughs> I I do not. Like I was watching them because I was watching them because I wanted to watch them, not because I had to watch them. Yeah. yeah, I mean I mean this show is a good excuse just to blow the dust off some VHS. Well, that's exactly like I think I, I think I mentioned on a previous episode that uh when when you asked me at the beginning of the year to come up with themes, I literally looked around my my Blu-ray and DVD and VHS collection and went, What haven't I watched that I really need the excuse to watch? And then just came up with themes around those. <laughs> and then yeah, that's right. they uh, happened so far in advance of when I came up with the ideas that I couldn't remember what films <laughs> I wanted to watch. Yeah. Uh, so wh- where did your mind go Like when we were talking about this theme of action movies that well, you might not the, have seen? The first thing I kind of, the first film I went to was a movie called Quite Cool with, um, yeah. uh, yeah, I can't remember his name. He's the guy from the Warriors, the the real um, kind of asshole one of the gang who gets handcuffed to mm-hmm. the park bench. What's his name? He's the dad from Dexter, and he's uh, oh, of course he is. He's, James um, Reamer. He's James, the guy that got James fired. Reamer. Yeah, the guy that got fired yeah. from Terminator, right? Or yeah. Alien at Terminator. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, um, Aliens. Yeah. I think it was uh, James Reamer, and it's a like it's a it's a Great movie. Zach from the Aster actually put me onto it. Um, and mm. it's like a actually I can't remember how we described it. it. Like it was like another film, but it's basically about this kind of DEA agent who heads back to his small southern hometown when he discovers that um a whole uh, like drug drug barons have kind of taken over the town and his kind of old girlfriend calls him back to help and he just happens to be a DEA yep. agent. Not that he goes back in any official capacity or anything. He just decides to go back on, while he's on holiday, enforced holiday, <laughs> and, you know, cleans up the town. And that, it was that kind of movie. Like, that was, I don't think it got a theatrical release here. I, I watched it on VHS. That's where I went with this. I was just like, it's all of those right. VHS movies. Like, one of the movies I tried to watch was, do you remember Mill Creek Entertainment? They brought out these, um, like, too cool for school box sets, which they have, like, they have 10 yes. movies and it's two movies per side per DVD. So yep. Yep, they're, I do. I've got they're a compressed to absolute shit. <laughs> like watching, <laughs> like I, I put one on, I, there was an action, there's an action one and there's one with, mm-hmm. there's a Greg Henry biker movie. And I was like, well, I've never seen this. <laughs> and it's Greg Henry. Like, you know, he's not, a, he's, sorry, he's a, he's a returned Vietnam vet. So it's supposed to be like a Rambo type thing. Yeah. And I was like, oh, Greg Henry, this is going to be great. I made it five minutes into that movie. <laughs> I was just like, this is fucking horrendous. Well, one of those one of those collections I've got uh, has all of the Operation Delta Force movies in it, plus like three other standalone <laughs> movies. Like they just threw three others They need to make on. up the numbers. Yeah, that's a good little sort of um, thing there because the music we have been playing underneath this intro is the soundtrack or score from Operation Delta Force. So way to tie it back in there, mate. Um, I also went to like the Missing in Action movies and Demolition High and even Cage 1 and 2. That's where my mind kind of went. Demolition High, what a fucking banger. I agree with you. I just couldn't find a good enough copy to revisit it in time for yeah, this. Right. So I didn't go with that. But um anyway, I can't hear I can't I can't wait to hear what you've chosen. Um but before we do crack on, as we alluded to before, we've got a great interview on this episode uh coming up a little bit later. I recently spoke with Richard Hughes. He's a Melbourne guy kicking all kinds of ass in America. He just made an actual fantastic um action thriller with Antonio Banderas called Enforcer. And um, it is, yeah, it's really worth getting um, a look at. The guy is actually the brother of Patrick Hughes. You know, the guy that made the um, Hitman's Bodyguard and Expendables 3 and Red Hill uh, and just recently started a production company with Greg McLean. Um, so, yeah, but this this guy, Richard, is an absolute character and it's a hilarious chat. So stick around. You don't want to miss that. But also the gang will be stepping up to the plate to deliver their weekly segments. So we have Guillermo Troncoso from Screen Realm. Uh, if you're new to the show, that's an entertainment uh, sort of online magazine that's um, all about movies and television. 
And then we also have the three guys from the Bonehead Weekly podcast, Joe, Chad, and James, doing what they do with funny American accents. Uh, that's a that's also a podcast you should check out, Bonehead Weekly. Right now, though, this is uh, Jarrett Garn from Monster Fest, who also happens to be something of an expert when it comes to all things physical media. <laughs> and so this is him doing what he does, letting you know what you should uh, spend your money on this week. Hey, this is Jarrett and welcome to PE class. Just first up, if you hear some strange sounds in the background, no, that's not a hostage I have captive. That is in fact my pug Archie, a 12 year old pug and he's snoring and I'm gonna let him so enjoy the sound of him snoring in the backdrop. Sweet mother of God, what is the hold up? Let the boy sleep in your damn bed! He said he'd wash the sheets! Anyway, let's move on to this week's releases. There's only two releases this week that are really worth talking about. It's a pretty quiet week for home entertainment, but these two releases, in fact, are really premium releases, and both of them are coming out from ViaVision. The first of which is the Dirty Dancing Collectors Limited Edition. Now this is a 3 disc set comprised of one 4K Ultra HD and two Blu-ray. It's housed in a steelbook and packaged in a 3D lenticular hard case. There's no doubt that this is the definitive release of Dirty Dancing, as it not only ports all of the special feature content from the US 4K Ultra HD release, but also includes an abundance of legacy material that no other edition has ported to this point in time. Loaded with commentaries, featurettes, deleted scenes, music videos, and even the concert tour from 1988. The only drawback of this release is the retail price. It's $99.95. Now, of course, you can find it a little bit cheaper at some specialist retailers, maybe $10 cheaper. But still, the question is, despite how large a fan base that this film has, and it's massive, are they willing to pony up $100 for this release? I'm contemplating it myself, as I adore this film, but honestly, I already have the US 4K Ultra HD, and that cost me a little more than $30, so I'm not sure I can justify such a large ticket price. Nobody puts baby in a corner. Anyway, also in the rather hefty price tag category is Via Vision's other limited edition release, Saw the Ultimate Collection. Now this one's limited to 1500 units and the main draw of this release is the replica reverse bear trap. It's a trap! However, only the original saw along with Jigsaw and Spiral are 4K Ultra HD. The rest of the films are all Blu-ray. So in my opinion, only having three of the ten films on 4K possibly doesn't qualify as the ultimate collection. In any case, in addition to those three films on 4K, you get them on Blu-ray as well as the remainder of the franchise entries on Blu-ray. There's also a bonus disc of extra feature content that covers special features from parts 2 through 7. There's no new special feature content, which is a shame. However, it does a great job of collecting all these legacy special features, and some of these haven't been released since the initial DVD releases. They didn't make it to the Blu-ray, so it does a really great job of collecting and putting them all into one package. Now, as for the retail price of this one, this bad boy is selling for a hefty ticket of $399.95. That's right, just under $400, five cents short of $400. So you'd need to be a massive enthusiast of the franchise to part with that much moolah. It's a trap. Anyway, that's it for me this week. So until next time, stay physical. Uh, well, there you go. Pretty light work this week for Jarrett. Not many new release movies coming, but cheers to him. Nevertheless, that was a pretty tidy little segment there. And of course, I said before, Jarrett is from Monster Fest and Monster Fest is right around the corner. Last week, they uh, revealed the final wave of programming. So everything that is screening is now up there for your eyeballs and tickets, I believe, are available. Yes, yeah? they certainly are. The Melbourne tickets at any rate. So head to the Monster Fest website and social media pages. Uh, check out the programming and yeah, buy tickets if you have. You know, if you're going along and just you know, if, whether it's just one screening or if you want to get along, you know, to the entire bloody festival. There's you know, yeah, there are passes. Ways. There are passes for all uh, for five films and for ten films and then the whole twenty five. I think. Amazing, amazing. But now, this is where we recommend stuff, Ben. It's your turn to step up to the mic and take it away. Well, I know just like, you know, 10 minutes ago, I was talking about how I watched a bunch of dodgy 80s action movies that only ever got VHS releases. And funnily <laughs> enough, I have gone in a completely opposite direction for the movies that I'm actually going to talk about 
that I decided on five minutes ago. <laughs> the first one is one lethal weapon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the first one is a movie that it uh, I look I've, I've known about it for years, and I always used to get it mixed up with another film starring Scott Glenn, uh, and it is the Yakuza. Oh yeah, which is from 1974, directed by Sidney Pollack, from a screenplay by Paul Schrader and Robert Town. With a story by Leonard Schrader, and if, if if Easy Rider's Raging Bulls is to be believed, <laughs> Paul basically just fucked Leonard out of the the writing credit because uh, he's a piece of shit. Uh, <laughs> like it's their whole relationship, their whole life. It's just it seems to be a thing of Paul stepping all over Leonard and taking credit that doesn't belong to him. But um, uh, our guest I'm on next week's show the... is Paul Schrader. Everybody, Paul Schrader, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh the other film the other film that i always get this mixed up for i think is the, it's called the challenge the challenge What's the that? scott glenn oh yeah yes, the challenge. Yes, 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 one, that scott one. glenn yeah, he's got the set and he's got the samurai sword and this one like this is a really like it's like one of those movies that you can tell because it's from 1974 the west had very little idea about <laughs> japanese culture and what and you know the way that they talk about the yakuza is it's almost as if they're like they're samurai. Well, it's like when they did. It's like when they did what um, was it? Enter the Ninja and American Ninja. Like they had no comprehension yeah. of what it actually was. Yeah, Franco Nero freely admits that he <laughs> didn't know what a ninja was. Never heard that word. I mean, maybe ninja's different in Italian, but you know, <laughs> ninjago. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> ninjago. I think that's what they called the Lego. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but this this movie and it also has a great cast. It basically, it stars uh, Robert Mitchum, who is this um, ex, and the way they talk about it, I'm, I'm assuming it's World War II, uh, but it could also be Korea or something, but, but they're, they're soldiers stationed in Japan, um, and Robert Mitchum, and like that, or they were, I should say, they were stationed in Japan, and there's, there was four of them. There's Robert Mitchum, uh, Herb Edelman, who is probably best known as... Um, as Stanley, B. Arthur's husband from the Golden Girls. <laughs> yeah. What an he's asshole! He's like, he's and he, but he's so good in this. But he's like a completely different. He's like the nice guy, kind of academic, yeah, guy in this film. Um, Brian Keith is the other one, and there's a fourth guy who who you don't actually ever see. Um, Brian Keith is like has become now. He's like a wealthy businessman, but as it turns out, he's like a wealthy gun runner, but you know, with illusions of grandeur. And uh, th- there's a fourth friend, but you, you never get to see the fourth friend, but his son, uh, played by Richard Jordan, who I really only, like, when he when he popped up on screen, immediately my thought was, this is the guy from uh, Hunt for Red October. He's, the like, the Secretary of Defense, who, who he's got a really strong Southern accent in, in that film. And he does that. He's got the great line, you know, he goes, I'm a politician. So if I'm not kissing babies, I'm stealing their candy. <laughs> Like it's that guy, yeah. But he's like really young, and he's like he he's supposed to be Brian Keith's kind of bodyguard or kind of you know personal assistant. And uh, James Keith ha- is doing is is has some dealings with the yakuza, and uh, there's a gun shipment that's been lost, and he can't give them. He's he was in financial trouble. He's spent the money. He can't pay them back. And the Yakuza, in order to make him kind of cough up the guns or the money, have kidnapped his daughter and are threatening if they, if he doesn't make it right in five days, they're going to send pieces of his daughter back. Right, yep. So he gets his old pal, Robert Mitchum, who's now like he's an ex kind of military police cop kind of character, who's now like a kind of retired private eye, to uh, go back with, with Richard Jordan and uh, sort some shit out. And of course, he left, you know, when he left Japan... The last time it was a bit messy and there's also all of that sort of stuff he has to deal with. Uh, and oh, James Shigita turns up the, uh, the uh, boss of uh, at Nakatomi towers yep, yep. in Die Hard. He turns up in it. It's, it's got this pretty kind of amazing cast and it's like in true Sydney Pollack and Schrader style, it is harsh. Like there aren't really any winners in this film. I was about like, to say, is it as brutal as I recall it being? Yeah. yeah, like it's pretty full on. There's lots of, there's lots of finger cutting, cuttings off. There's, uh, you know, <laughs> it, all, there's... that was like a trope back in like the seventies and eighties. Like if it was like if you had an Asian bad guy, 
the punishment was always yeah. to lose a finger. Yeah, they love cutting the fingers off. But this one, they're all cutting their own fingers off. Yeah. As a sign of uh, apology or something. Yeah, I offer you. Or, or yeah, debt yeah. that cannot be repaid. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, but it is like, yeah, super full on, but it moves It moves at a cracking pace and it is a, a stellar watch. Time for a revisit, I think, because um, the universe is pointing me towards it because I keep seeing the poster pop up lately. So I yeah. might have to do that. So um, for mine, I think... In my opinion, there are there are two of two of the most underrated names in action today would have to be Scott Atkins and Jesse V. Johnson. I talk about Scott Atkins a lot on the show. So I'm dedicating my first recommendation to both of them. Um this one was made in 2019. It's a British action thriller called Avengement. Now, right off the bat, two things need to be said about this. Uh firstly, Scott Atkins actually believes this to be his best film. Uh, and I would agree. I think it's his best performance. Uh, but <laughs> he also has a very big issue with the name of the movie Avengement because it's not actually a real word and it's quite embarrassing to him. <laughs> no, when you sent me the, when you sent me a text telling me what the movies uh, you were yeah. going to potentially going to do, I said whoever came up with that name should be fired from movies forever. <laughs> yeah, it's true, Avengement, like it's terrible. But I'm telling you, this is terrible. And there are so many better hard cutting names that you know edgy names that you could have gone with you know for this one but you could have gone with revengement <laughs> yeah, or, just... <laughs> or fistament there, whatever his name was just go with his name as the title but there anyway uh it is a great movie though this one plays out very much like an ultraviolet sort of violent i should say guy Ritchie movie it's just 100 percent r-rated stuff like really really brutal and jesse v johnson as a director is really good at that kind of thing um a bit like Isaac Florentine is a similar kind of director where he's really good at choreography, whereas this guy's just really good at action and like connecting fists to faces, you know, in camera, stuff like that. It is like, it's kind of like a throwback to that. You know, I remember all the reviews of Get Carter were so kind of, yep. you know, yep. we're talking about the violence because even though, even though he, like they rarely use a gun, the, the fist to face violence was so brutal and realistic. And that's what this film. Yeah. Um, so the, the basic premise is Scott Atkins plays like an ultra violent um, and really scary looking motherfucker who escapes from prison right at the start while he's on like a high security uh, escort to visit his dying mother. Um, and yeah, he breaks away somewhere in the hospital. And then he, the first thing he does, he goes to a private pub where a bunch of gangsters are hanging out and he holds them hostage and torments them while slowly revealing his motive and his reason for doing it in a series of flashbacks, but they're flashbacks that work very well. Like they're just really delicately placed and it flows, it just flows so nicely. Um, and the cast in this movie, there's some familiar faces. Um, uh, Nick Moran from Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels. He was like the main guy in that movie. He's in that. Um, Louis Mandelore is in it and he's actually quite good as the the copper. Um, Craig Fairbass. It's just, yeah, it's, it's a really, really good cast. And, um, but there's no denying that, that Scott Atkins just takes the cake, man. He's so fucking good in this and he's different to what he's been in everything else. And I feel like, has he got like a metal mouth guard? Yeah, he's got, cause there's a the horrific scene where he gets his teeth smashed out. They put his yeah. face on a step and stomp on it. Very similar to, uh, that Edward Norton movie, American History X. Um, yeah, that's right. Because he escapes from prison, but while he's in prison and in all those flashbacks, they show how like he went in as a kind of I was a, normal. I was, a, I was kind about of to guy. get to that because yeah, he yeah. goes in pretty much as um uh yeah, he's a nice guy, but he's also quite a wuss, you know. He he runs away from confrontation as opposed to confront you know, confronting it. But the the movie sh tells his trajectory from from pussy to fucking, you know, hardcore henry if you want to call it like he's just absolutely bonkers and he's mad too like he just goes absolutely mad he's insane but it's kind of like it's like the training sequences in wanted mm -hmm. like at least especially in the comic of wanted I'm, i can't re really remember how they do it in the film but in the comic book they basically tie and the, the funny thing is is mark miller when he did that comic he basically he cast the film yeah. he illustrated the main character was because and he did it so if they ever make a movie they can't change the cast and of course, they they changed it completely. But in the comic, it was uh, Eminem is supposed to be the main guy, <laughs> and they tie Eminem to a chair and beat the shit out of him for days on end, so he gets used and he gets used to it and doesn't fear yep. pain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
and that's that's basically the hardening process that they put Scott Atkins through in this film. They certainly do, and the camera does not flinch. You know, when you see his teeth get smashed out, they get smashed out. When you see a guy yeah. get his head blown off, you see his head get blown off. Like it is really gnarly. Um, and I, I would just say before we move on that the there's a, an amazing pub brawl scene in this that I reckon gives the the Kingsman church scene a run for its money. Like it is just incredible like and talk about camera choreography with action jesse v johnson gets his camera in every nook and cranny for this scene it's just yeah. quite amazing and yeah i was gonna say they're both okay but the best pub scene <laughs> is the one from the other guys where they do it in the slow motion and someone's getting pissed on and <laughs> yeah that's pretty good <laughs> but um yeah J- uh, jesse v johnson and scott atkins have made a whole lot of movies together and if this is a good one to start with because um then you can go back and sort of i think the first one they did was one called pit fighter which i was almost going to do for this um and then if you build your way through their career there's some really good stuff uh the accident man the debt collector yeah so worth looking at there you go um i'll say it one more time avengement <laughs> avengement <laughs> How's it going, everybody? It's Guillermo here from Screen Realm. That's ScreenRealm.com and Screen Realm on YouTube. Be sure to check us out. Check out everything we've got going on. As always, I'm here to tell you about some of the big movie news stories from the past week. Kicking off with Red One, a Dwayne Johnson and Chris Evans starring action holiday film. Cameras are now rolling on the Prime Video production and Oscar winner J.K. Simmons and Emmy nominee Bonnie Hunt have boarded respectively as Santa and Mrs. Claus. There aren't any plot details as of yet except that it's an action film, it's got holiday characters and it's going to be a jet-setting world-traveling tale of an adventure. The film is being directed by Jake Kasdan who directed Johnson in Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle and Jumanji The Next Level. The folks over at Amazon certainly have high hopes for this and are aiming to make this a franchise. Because of course. Viola Davis will be playing the US president in an upcoming action film titled G20. Set to be directed by Patricia Regan, known for the 33, G20 will see terrorists overtake the G20 summit, but they didn't count on American President Taylor Sutton to be played by Viola Davis. She's going to be bringing all her statecraft and military experience to defend her family, her fellow leaders, and the world. God bless America. The film, which is another one from Amazon Studios, was written by Noah and Logan Miller, White Boy Rick, with revisions by Caitlin Parrish and Enrico Weiss, The Red Lion. Free Guy director and Stranger Things executive producer Sean Levi is in talks to direct a Star Wars film. Deadline broke the news reporting that Levi will be focusing on the film after he completes Deadpool 3, which will be starring Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman. At the time of recording, there aren't any details to go on as to what Star Wars chapter Levi will be directing, but Levi did confirm the news. On social media, he posted the news headline and wrote, Childhood me is losing his shit right now, grown up me is too. The voice cast of Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, which is Sony's upcoming follow-up to Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, has added Daniel Kaluuya. The Get Out star will be voicing super-powered New York teenager Herbert Herbie Brown, aka Spider-Punk. That Marvel character was introduced in The Amazing Spider-Man Volume 3, number 10, in 2015. Daniel Kaluuya is joining quite the voice cast, which includes Shamik Moore, Haley Steinfeld, Oscar Isaac, Brian Tyree Henry, Luna Lauren Valez, Greta Lee, Jason Schwartzman, and many more. As of now, Spider-Man Beyond the Spider-Verse is set to hit cinemas in March 2024. That about does it for me, everyone. Be sure to go to YouTube and type in Screen Realm. We've had a lot of content going up. Yours truly has reviewed The Menu and Black Panther Wakanda Forever. So check out my video reviews of those films. Be sure to also watch my interview with Deirdre Mullins, the star of the new Shutter horror film called Mandrake. Thanks a lot, everyone. Catch you next week.
Hey, Ben, do you remember the movie Fixing the Shadow, a.k.a. Beyond the Law? Charlie Sheen? Oh, he's the biker? Yeah, and he had a mullet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, that's a really fantastic movie. Um, but that... And isn't... Isn't uh, what's that? Is, is it Michael Madsen? Is he in yep, that as well? He sure is. But yep. it was kind of before he was before you know Tarantino made him huge. Yeah, I, I think this is around the same time. And um, he plays the bad biker. Charlie Sheen plays the cop infiltrating the biker gang. Anyway, that song was called Hell's Kitchen by Asphalt Ballet, and that is from Fixing the Shadow. So that was a movie cool. I definitely could have talked about on the show. I love that one. Once again, very hard to find. You know. Yeah. Which is a shame. I did have it on VHS, and you know what I did? Sold them all. <laughs> Sold them all. That's why. That's why I keep all my VHS. It's it kills me every time I sell one that's that is not because you just don't know what the hell's not going to be available in five minutes yeah, time. And I love that era too, where they there there are a lot of movies with bikies, you know, where they would come and take over a small town, and it's such a good trope that they don't do a lot of anymore. Like even Best of the Best Four. There's another one that you know a lot of people haven't seen. That's a bikey movie in a small town. Arguably the best, best of the best three yeah. and best of the best four are just such bizarre movies for the for the franchise. Yeah, but I will go on the record and say that number three and four are better than number one and two. Uh, <laughs> they're not fight movies, that's for sure. <laughs> no, they're completely different. No, they turn into different into it, like three. It should have just been. It's <laughs> it's almost like part four should have been uh, best of the best part three part two. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, one of the uh, one of the movies I almost did was because uh, I'd never seen it. A guy Pierce made a movie a few years ago called Disturbing the Peace with um is it Devin Sawyer, and that's a biker movie. He plays the cop in the town that has to you know move them on. And I remember watching the trailer. Uh, the poster really caught my attention. I thought this looks like a great movie. Guy Pierce never lets you down. And I watched about twenty minutes of it, and holy fuck, it's awful. And then I read that um that Guy Pierce cites it as his worst movie, and it's a total embarrassment to him. So <laughs> yeah, right. I tried. I tried to watch that film. I made it about ten minutes in. It's shocking. It's shocking. Anyway, it was just. It was kind. Of, it looked like it was trying to be a knockoff of that Arnie movie with Johnny Knoxville. Oh yeah, The Last Stand. Yeah, totally, totally. Anyway, there we go. So now on to you know the 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 showcase of the episode, my interview. Um, yeah, this is a movie that so far has had very little fanfare, and yet it's precisely the type of movie that fans of 80s and 90s action thrillers should get excited about like there's a real nostalgic kind of quality to it. it's called the enforcer and i would describe this one as john wick meets man on fire um and it's from millennium entertainment and you know they've been pumping action movies out for over 30 years they used to be was it new image you know those guys that um they gave us recently they gave us rambo last blood olympus has fallen home front um Speaking of Scott Atkins, they did the Undisputed series and the Mechanic and the Expendables. Like they are just a powerhouse of, you know, action movies. There's some yeah, great. You just read off some great titles. Yeah, and and then of course they also did the Hitman's Bodyguard, which you know, as I said, were directed by his brother Patrick. But, um, yeah, Richard Hughes, this guy is hilarious. Um, I could sit down and talk with him again. I hope he comes back on the show. I have a funny feeling he would because he was so personable. Uh, so I'll, I'll let you all hear for yourself. Here's my chat. It's great fun. And we'll see you on the other side. You have been where I am right now. I'm a made man. Tonight you are nobody. Cool. When did you get out? There's no space for mercy. It's awesome to be chatting with you, mate. Like, how are you, sir? I'm really good at the moment. I've kind of came back from post in Bulgaria about, uh, Three months ago, I was living in Sofia. So we shot the film in Greece um, over the road from Bulgaria. I guess it's the next state. Um, and that is just a three and a half little drive, three and a half hour drive to Thessaloniki, which is where we shot the film. But during the, after that, we then moved post-production to Sofia where the studios, New Boyana Studios were set. And then I kind of lived in an edit suite there for six months. And then I came home about June. God, time flies, wow. I'll tell you that. Jeez, mate. So well, now look. back here, I've got the whole of winter, I managed to scape into a few footy games. <laughs> um, i got to thank that AFL footy pass too, because I was able to watch <laughs> watch the games overseas. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, just getting on with it. Now I'm writing, I've just finished another script, um, one of my own. So I'm just about to click send on that too. 
Amazing. Well, let's talk about Enforcer because I actually, I, I fucking love this movie. And I and people that listen to my show know that I'm not just blowing smoke up your ass. Like, I actually love it. Oh, thanks, it's, brother. It's right up my alley, this type of movie. So yeah. I want to just give a bit of context for the people listening. Like, what is your story? I know you began making commercials, but how did you end up going from that to making like a kick-ass action film with Antonio Banderas? Oh, look, man, it's a bit of a crazy one. So, I mean, initially... I came out of film school. Um, I did a couple of years at RMIT and uh, it was good, but I kind of really, enough of the theory, I just really wanted to get out there. And I just, um, I knocked on Channel 7 store and I uh, started, um, uh, got a job there editing sports cuts at, in, during the AFL season. So I worked there for seven years, but on about my fourth, fifth year, I started picking up the camera um, a lot and started shooting a lot of stories. And then kind of from there, I was like, Shit, I don't know. Sorry, is there swearing here? I don't yeah, want to. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, yeah. For your life, well, mate. I thought, oh, fuck. I might, as well, uh, I might as well make a short here because I was starting to feel like I always wanted to be a director. But, you know, it takes a bit of time to find out who you really are. And I was about 27 at that stage. So after doing shorts, I kind of pushed that. My first short got into Sydney Film Festival, which was kind of fun. And then opened a little production company where we really did... um. A lot of viral stuff is what is what exploded us. So I was doing a lot of viral marketing stuff. So we kind of um, created about ten clips that got about a billion views on YouTube. Um, I don't know. My face is on one of them. I'm the tornado guy um, <laughs> that's doing a selfie in front of a tornado. So that kind of <laughs> lived a little life for that. And then off the commercials, I really my, my whole game was just to make a feature, make a feature. Um, and then when I kind of closed that company down, I had, I had a kind of choice to make myself was either go down the track of advertising, um, mm -hmm. which can get a little deteriorating, you know, it's kind of eats your soul a little bit, but mm. it's what puts some food on the table, I guess. Um, and then, so after that, I wrote a script and that was called punk and I sent that off and it was the first script I've ever written, um, like just me and. Through that, man, I like attached Cara Delevingne and I was in the States having these crazy meetings and that was about to get up. And then COVID came, as I was explaining before, and it kind of shut the gates on a lot of production because all the film studios for like a year and a half. So that kind of dissipated a little bit. Um, and uh, as I said before, I was driving trucks just to pay rent at that stage. So mm -hmm. I... Um, keep it coming in and then I but because I was close to getting up with a company called Millennium um, and New Boyana in Sofia uh, I became quite close with the studio head Yariv Lerner and mm. we just stayed in loose contact and he called me up and I was camping one day in Wire River and I mean film's my passion that is it for me it's like a sickness <laughs> I can't I can shake tell. so you either got it or you don't, but if you, if you, if for anyone that wants to know, you know, how hard it can get, it gets really hard. Um, and there, this industry is filled with people who, um, tap out. So as long as you don't tap out, you might get that call. And when I was in Wire River, I got a message from your Riv and it was, uh, Hey, can you get it to any reception? So I went onto the lawn pier there. <laughs> Cause there's not much reception down there. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. he pretty much, I said, "Hey, mate," and I had a feeling something good was happening because nothing good had happened in about a year. So I thought, "Oh," and he's like, "Hey, do you want to? Do you want odd question? Do you want to direct a movie with Antonio Banderas shooting in five weeks?" And I was like, "What? Huh. Uh, yeah, <laughs> sure. What's the script?" So look, he sent me the script, and then I pretty much drove down to Melbourne that night, read the script. Um, had to make some changes and modernize it. It was a cool script, but it was just um, it was probably a little bit dated, like written 15, 20 years ago. And the world's changed a lot since then, as yeah. we know. So we just modernized it a little bit, um, set it in Miami. It was originally set in New Orleans and kind of kept the same thematic. Um, and then they were saying, they were like, well, if you want to shoot in Miami, we could shoot in Greece. There's some great tax breaks there and it's around the corner. So I was like, wow. So I went from driving trucks to suddenly on a plane <laughs> with my girl Amazing. with my girlfriend at that time um and we were landing in greece and stepping straight into pre-production and casting and everything so it kind of once that ball got rolling it was great but i had a great team around me um it went really well 
Yeah, so man, that's like, how I got the call, man. That's incredible, and you, you've preempted so many questions I have, which is fantastic. Sorry, uh, brother. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's great. It means there's no awkwardness of me like trying to you know, shoehorn something into the conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, that's fine. But, but like all your commercial work explains why the movie looks so deliciously highly stylized. Like, was there a shock to the system going from you know driving trucks to suddenly you're in the world of feature films? Like, was it what you anticipated? Um. Look, I've been on some big ad sets and stuff like that, but really that nothing really get, gets you prepared for film. The big number one thing for me, I'm a very visual director. Um, and as much as, you know, this is me stepping in on an opportunity to direct a movie, it's not particularly my script from the script from the get-go, but I was like, I'm going to make this the best thing I can do with it. And I think it's a ball terror. And I'm going to make it a visual masterpiece. And as long as I can have my DNA in it and set yeah. my career up, so when people have a calling card and they go, Rich Hughes, oh, you made that. And it's like every film I want to do has a lot of heart in it. And I'll always yeah. want to feed that through. Um, but when I landed there, I mean, man, we were living straight out of the height for five months. I think I stayed in the height in Greece. So it's pretty good. I didn't have a bag. <laughs> and I had a huge pool. It felt like I was living on a golf links. So we were in Thessaloniki, <laughs> which is a place I'd never heard of, but apparently... Yeah. Everyone in Thessaloniki, when I went there, were like, oh, where are you from? Like Melbourne. They're like, oh, the third biggest Greek city in the world. I was like, oh, yeah, it is. Because about six of my mates are Greek and we've been calling each other Malakas for years. But if you mention the word Malaka in Greece, they really like, it's apparently it's like the C word is here. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I think it's kind of offensive. So I didn't do it too much. Um, <laughs> unless I had a couple of beers in me. But um, yeah, man, jumping straight in, there was no time. Um, I was doing rewrites as well with a good uh, writer, a friend of mine called Luke Bouchier. He's in Sydney. He's also an ad director. So I couldn't have done it by myself in that respect with the amount of time. So I brought a, a friend, talented friend of mine um, with me and we really hit the ground running. So we were kind of like a couple of cowboys just attacking this thing. But they, I had a great producing team behind me. Um, and look, they were guiding me through the process because it's all well and good doing a two-day, you know, pure milk ad in bloody Ballarat or something and you're in and <laughs> yeah. out in a few days, you know, and it's like a week's work. But this is a different ball game. So it's kind of like five weeks pre and then you've got to go with, um, you know, I think it was like 32 days or 28 days or something. Oh, yeah. Shoot. But God, it doesn't stop, mate. And um, yeah, it's hell, hell, hell to the le leather to the hell. I can't even pronounce my words now. Uh, but <laughs> it, uh, yeah, it, it never really stopped, mate. It was so much fun and the energy on set. I'm all about keeping the big energy on set um, yeah. and keep, keeping it fun. Because in the end, we're making a movie and it's, it's, it's something that I do not take for granted because I've seen what the other side is like too. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it can get gritty and hard as well for everyone's profession so um it's wasn't a uh, it's it's something i really hold close to my heart and i really wanted to make a good impression and that's what it was about so yeah, i right. hope that answers your question yeah for sure you know my favorite uh, i think action slash fight choreographer is probably isaac florentine and i kind of feel yeah. like some of the stuff that you've done in this film is very much from that sort of same same ballpark of what he does were, were there any influences that you drew upon to sort of you know stage and, and choreograph your action and violence oh uh, uh, not so i mean look not so much choreograph because this is a new kind of theme to me the whole Look, I've been growing up on action films my whole life. Die Hard 1 is probably still one of my favourite films of all time. But I think some of the films that, you know, there's some Tony Scott elements of Man on Fire in there. Definitely. And there's elements of Equalizer. I mean, I'm a massive Denzel fan as well. You can't help yourself. So uh, I, a lot of those, but both of those films carry a lot of heart as well, which I find yep. important because, I mean, John Wick does it as well. Um, although that's mega, mega action. They got the world at their feet. The only yeah. thing that was stopping me was time, you know? So you only got so yeah. many times. But when you've got a huge franchise like that, you can really push it to the next level. So look, man, I, I had an amazing stunt team of these crazy Bulgarians, hardly spoke a word of English, and they were nutcases. And they were built of like black belts, karate dudes, taekwondo, jujitsu dudes. And then, uh, I don't know if you know that first opening fight scene, who Mojan, the Aussie actors, he's fighting one of the stunt guys and he's just like this brick shit house. 
dude that looked like he was from the USC. But, and that, but then again, and then the other, Antonio's body double, he's from Ilko. He's amazing. He took me, he's sponsored by Red Bull and he but jumps off cliffs doing base jumping. Oh, it's just, there's a wealth of knowledge up in those mountains. I mean, in Australia, we kind of have a little bit of that, but they've just got something in the water up there. And they're a lot more hard nosed, and you know they're big, big <laughs> people. You know, yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, Antonio Banderas as well. He's jumping right into the action pool lately. Like he's getting his hands, you know, dirty with this. Yeah, stuff and getting, it's fantastic. getting blood on the knuckles, mate. <laughs> what's he? Uh, what's he like to work with? Because I, I thought you know, this was the movie made for him. It was great. Look, it's it's he's a funny one because I have had the same thing. I'm like, what's he going to be like? And I'm like. You know, I could get the feeling everyone's probably gone up to him and gone, man, Desperado, Desperado. <laughs> but he too, when I had dinner with him, told me, he's like, we made Desperado on a budget of like $300,000, Richard. And and the people who've been shot in that movie were shot multiple times and they put wigs on, they dressed them like women. So it's just <laughs> yeah. the, the, everyone kind of has been through the same journey and to hear that from him, but he's probably one of the kindest, nicest kind of people in the industry that I've met. I mean, I haven't met any big players like that, um, but he's uh, just a class act and he puts, no matter what film or what project it is, he has so much passion for it. He really cares. Um, and he had a lot of patience with me as well, understanding that it was my first film as well in terms of features. So he to be able to just sit in the truck with him every day, we had a kind of green tea every morning in his truck and he'd show me, photos family photos and show me his um his theater school in malaga and all these things. i've got, uh-huh. got a really personal relationship with him but when he was on set he's just bang bang yeah. bang and also he had some great ideas so he was he was a really really lovely guy but it did get to a point where <laughs> to get the movie green i had to sell i had to watch like, this phone call the producer's like rich this phone call's big. You got to nail this. You got to. And if there's one thing I'm good at, it's phone calls. And I had him jumping out of his seat. He's like, Gabriel, I'm going to work with this guy. I got to work with this. So then I hang up the phone. I was like, almost a mic drop. Drop my phone. Oh, I'm like, mate. there's your guy. We're done. Antonio's coming. And then he came the next two days. And yeah, it was lovely. It was lovely. He's got a wealth of knowledge and he's such a genuine person. I can't wait to catch up with him again one day. That is freaking classic. And I think that's another thing that sets this film apart is that quite often these type of action films, you can tell when the lead is phoning it in and it's just a paycheck, but this actually felt something sincere and important for me. Yeah, them. yeah, it did. And I think it kind of translates through the script and the heart involved. And it's like those films. I mean, you know, I mentioned it before, but Man on Fire is such a beautiful film. Um, the thematic, the moral compass. You know, yeah. and that's what this film revolves around is a man that isn't exactly a great person, but he's ready to turn a leaf. And the way I always put it and pitch to the people is like, I'm like, what's what's Antonio's character? And it's like, imagine if Tony Montana never died, what would he be doing today in Miami? And that is what Cuda is. And he's an older guy, older statesman, and the wealth of you know, young crime and the dark web is in their underswell is something he can't really understand. And when it kind of crosses his moral compass, which is, you know, messing with kids, it's his, he, it's something he's going to do about it. So, you know, I think he's, I think he's great for action and he really, he does all his own stunts and fighting is all in there. So he was great. Yeah, cool. A um, couple of things I want to touch upon before I let you run. Uh, you you touched upon the script earlier and how you had to spruce it up. And if yep. I mean, if people aren't already sold on this film already, like the fact yep. is that original script was written by Peter Illiff, who I know, you know point a, break. a titan, how a titan. Get yeah, like, a titan. Point break. I know. He sent me a lovely email saying, "Mate, I uh, I wrote this film 15 years ago and I've been trying to get it up." And I'm writing an email like, "Mate, it's an absolute pleasure." And he even said, "He goes, man, I watched your short films too online. I love them." <laughs> and I was like, "Oh my god, this is Peter Rillip." So no, it was it was an absolute honor to kind of collaborate in that way and be able to take it off his hands and um, turn it into something that we're both really proud of. So um, I'm just all eyes and ears because you know it came out in the states. 
I'm, I just miss the releasing worldwide at the same time. This staggered streaming thing, something yeah. I'm going to wrap my head around that. <laughs> yeah. But I'm, I'm yeah. still thankful to, to be able to see it. But we watched it at my brother's. My brother's a director too, so we watched it on his big screen. He's a little bit more established than me and a bit more <laughs> bald, a bit more bald as well. So he has yeah. a big projector screen, so he kind of watched it as a family. It was really nice. And he's no stranger to Millennium Media either. So, you know, you're both in the same uh No, fraternity. well, that's kind of how I got a little bit of the meeting. I When he was doing Hitman's 2, Hitman's 1, Hitman's Bodyguard 1, he, he's, he was doing pickups and he was a little bit lonely. He'd been over there for t- 10 months. So I went over there and visited him. And I went and visited him and he just went go-karting and said, you're looking after the unit. So I was there on set. <laughs> But it gave me the ability to sit next to your rib. And that whole time, mate, I was just pitching my own stuff. And yeah. I was doing cutaway shots of hands <laughs> on guns, passing a passport. And yeah, I was I was a hand double for Ryan in that, like with a gun trigger and stuff. <laughs> so it's funny how it all works like that, isn't it? But oh, yeah, totally. It, yeah, they're great people over there and they're really, really eager and actions they're kind of number one little yeah little pocket but uh yeah for an independent film company now they've just turned into a mega beast you know and they've got some big films coming out as well so absolutely and i gotta say when yep. i finished filming in greece it's weird you know when the energy leaves on the set it's like a, all the camp leaves i was still editing in greece for a few months and i was in the high and it was just empty for a week and then my producer goes, oh, we're going to be all moving in there for Expendables 4. So that was shooting in Greece too, because they, they're building studios out there in yeah. Thessaloniki. And I'm like, oh, cool. Suddenly all the energy comes back because all the, these new crews are coming <laughs> yeah. in. And I'm sitting in there like, oh, who are these people? This is cool. Because I'm still a kid in Disneyland. <laughs> all of a sudden, I'm going back to my room and I walk past 50 Cent. I was like, you're kidding me. So I had to go and grab a little <laughs> selfie from him. I was unashamable. <laughs> and he did, oh, I don't want to go, oh, bro, I'm some filmmaker. I did the last, that's desperate. I was like, bro, massive fan, thanks. I just probably <laughs> thought I was a, a dude going for a sunbake, but it was really cool experience, mate. That's hilarious, mate. Um, I, I'm thrilled that this stuff has taken off for you, mate. It sounds like- you know, Oh, thank you, man. Couldn't be more well-deserved. And I, I want to give you the, the final word here, like just to- pitch punk is that still happening yeah it is mate oh, it's now uh it's now got a name change gangway um and i've just rewritten it but it's about a bunch of train surfers robbing banks and escaping awesome. on the rail of freight <laughs> networks around north america it's high octane and i'm uh look i'd say i've gained a really close relationship with someone from euphoria and it looks like they're going to be banging into that too. So that's a little Easter egg for you. Amazing. Um, what a great chat this has been. Like I, I've had a great time talking to you. I could probably pick your brain for hours on end. Oh, that's look- fine, mate. It's my, anytime yeah. you want, give me a call, brother. All good. Will do. So thank you so much and uh, good luck with what's next, mate. Oh, cheers, mate. Thank you so much. Welcome to Bonehead Weekly Fun Size. We're talking about obscure action, blow them up, shoot them up, bang, 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 movies that you may never have seen. I'm going to go first before James takes mine. 2007 gave us the best movie directed by the guy that also gave us Monster Man. Starring Clive Owen, Monica Bellucci, and Paul Giamatti. Yep, that was the first one I was going with. You're you're right to stop me, Joe. (laughs) Shoot them up. Because James and I saw this. Chad, were you with us? No, I saw this by myself and was absolutely amazed. I love that movie. Uh, a, a guy named Mr. Smith delivers a woman's baby during a shootout and then called upon to protect a newborn from an army of gunmen led by, by way, Paul Giamatti. Fairly depressing note. Out of print in the United States. Yeah, and it's not on any streaming services in the United no. States. That you Once don't. again, though, gentlemen, why do we have physical media? Because it's there on the shelf. Oh, Coming right over it. there on my shelf as well. I own it as well. But I, it, that was a movie that was supposed to be. I remember the making of on the documentary for, and I'm not going to go much more into it about the director and how this is going to be his breakout hit. And it really just killed his career. He had a low budget success film called monster truck or monster man, which is about a guy who drives a monster truck and kills people. And it just didn't work. And that movie is so much fun. I need to go back and watch it sometime, but yeah, if you all have never seen shoot Him up, check it out. James. Take- I'm going with my other one that I just enjoy. Um, it's not shoot Him up. 
but I must admit, I caught it again. And I was like, nope, still enjoy it. It's not Shakespeare, but Hardcore Henry, I, I've got to give a shout out to. Made on $2 million, so unfortunately acquired for $10 million, which is why it was not considered a success. Um, it's basically a first-person shooter made into an action film. And it's just, it's uh, Charlito Copley is is in it and is, of course, phenomenal. Um, but if you've ever thought, I'd like to play a video game, except I don't want to have to hold a controller. Hardcore Henry is an over-the-top shoot 'em up action film. If you've never seen it, check it out. After you watch shoot 'em up though, because shoot 'em up is better. Hey, second place ain't bad. That's all right. Jay, Chad. Okay. So I want to talk, and by the way, full disclosure, I haven't been watching nothing but action films, but this whatever I have going on is completely shutting my brain down, not COVID. I want to talk about a movie where it is a direct ripoff of a popular movie, The Karate Kid, um, directed by, from the director of The Best of the Best 1 and 2, Showdown, directed by Robert Radler. Uh, instead of Pat Morita, we have the talented Billy Blanks in the role of the school janitor who teaches the kid how to do martial arts, who is being picked on by the martial arts bully in the school. Uh, it is a it is a forgotten action film that actually I enjoy. Um, I saw it several years ago, and it's it it is fully entertaining in its pure cheesiness and direct ripoff of the Karate Kid. Um, it's the only I think it it may be the only good Billy Blanks movie ever made. Glenn will probably have an argument for me with that one. I can't wait to hear it. Um, but yeah, it is, and it also stars a very young Christine Taylor. Um, before she got her big start with the Brady Kid, Brady Bunch movie, um, 1993's Showdown. All right, this has been Bonehead Weekly Fun Size. There you go, some beauties there from the Boneheads. Um, I'm so glad that that Chad talked about Showdown because um, that is essentially the type of movie what my brain also went to. You know, when thinking about this episode, that whole era of sort of director video action movies from the 80s and 90s is phenomenal but um showdown man do you, this one was this one was released here as american karate tiger i have no um, recollection of this and, film well as 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 chad um spoke about it's a complete carbon copy of the karate kid it's you know billy blanks plays a miyagi character <laughs> and you had like um patrick kilpatrick as crease like doing the crease yeah, right. role. i mean i remember i remember do you remember karate warrior and they're like yeah, six yeah, yeah. six karate warriors that are like exactly like Karate Kid, but incredibly like a lot more full on and harsh. Yeah. Well, I mean, you had all these franchises too back then that went under different names. And like some of the sequels had a different name yeah. just to connect them with it. Like, so they're connected with multiple franchises. Cause what's it? I think King of the Kickboxes has about five different names. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's in the um, no, no retreat, no surrender it's box. A, in, in, Cause it, you know, <laughs> Before the internet, you could just retitle a film and no one would know. So if there was a different craze, you could go, yeah. oh, no, this film that we made five years ago, we're just going to change the title and release it as a new film that's taking that's taking the piss out of that one. Totally. Yeah. Uh, well, talk about that, like that Jean-Claude Van Damme movie, um, Wrong Bet. Like that's also called Leon. It's called Lionheart. Lionheart. It's called <laughs> Without Consent. Like, Jesus, man. But just quickly to answer... Uh, Chad's question um, about Billy Blanks, you know, yes, Showdown is hard to go by, but are we forgetting about Blood Fist? <laughs> <laughs> Talk about a fucked up franchise. I've got, I've got a bunch of uh... Billy Blanks action movies floating around here. There's, there's one he did with uh, Rowdy Roddy Piper. Yeah, but didn't didn't he also do like um, exercise videos? Yeah, Tybo. He's the king of Tybo. Yeah, he's Tybo. He, he, is the guy, he is the face of Tybo. Yeah, that's what he was that's what as far as i knew that's what he was famous for like yeah, yeah, yeah. he was in a bunch of those um uh Glick, james glickhouse produced action movies like the red scorpion but not red scorpion like it would have been like red scorpion 2 and yeah yeah, yeah. And stuff like that <laughs> yeah He's, he was in a lot of that type of movie oh far out but um hey, thank you to the boneheads of course listen to their show everywhere you get podcasts from or watch it on youtube particularly our episode ben and i were on it recently and um, by the time you're listening to this, it won't be far away. I reckon maybe look out for it this weekend or next. That was good fun, hey? Yeah, it was great. I had a great time. Yeah. I can't yeah. imagine that anyone's going to enjoy listening to that episode, except for you and me afterwards. <laughs> I reckon people will get a kick out of it for all of 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes. Not and for then the two hours be- that we... <laughs> no, <laughs> then it just becomes a wank fest, man. 
<laughs> just all yeah. waving our dicks in the air, having a good time. <laughs> yeah. Fuck, we had, we had a great time. And we did. And now it's your turn to wave your dick in the air again. So, <laughs> well, okay. Well, so this one, this one, like, like yours is a relatively new film. Mm. Once again, as far removed as uh, <laughs> it could be. And I, I actually, I don't even know how unknown this movie is because I actually watched it on Netflix. Oh, okay. Uh, so it is easily available. It's a, but I figured because it's, it's a French action movie mm. and I, in recent months, I've become a big fan of like French, French action films, like the kind of more recent action movies. Yep. Uh, and so when I saw this one kind of pop up on my feed, I was like, fuck yes. <laughs> uh, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's got this, it's called Lost Bullet. No, I haven't heard of it. Uh, it's from, uh, it's from 2020. The original title is Bal Perdu. Bad oh, now I know you. it. No, <laughs> not really. <laughs> uh, and it's directed by uh, uh, Guillaume Pierre. Pierret? Pierret? <laughs> Pierre. And it stars also a bunch. Look, most of the actors, I, I don't even want to pronounce their names, but if you are a fan of the TV show Call My Agent, <laughs> a.k.a. Uh, Pour Dis Percent, Pour Dis Percent, uh, <laughs> a lot of the actors will be familiar to you because there's a couple of... Uh, a couple, like a couple of the main cast are from that show, and you're like, "Oh my god, it's that!" How many people listening do you think you just spoke to? Yeah, none. I just, I just, <laughs> it's for my own benefit, strictly for my own benefit. <laughs> and basically, the story of this film is uh, this kind of this car mechanic. At the start of the film, he kind of, he's helping his idiot brother out of a jam, and he essentially fortifies this piece of shit car which they talk about it like i should know the brand of car but i mean it's it i think it's just like a cheap french car that has never been exported right uh, and it's it looks like a like a really shitty cheap hatchback type car and he fortifies it and they try to he his brother needs to get 10 grand fast to pay back a, a gambling debt or some kind of debt so he fortifies this car and their idea is he's going to ram through the front brick wall of a jeweler's and, and so they can steal all the jewelry and then take off. He, unfortunately, he beefs up the car too much. He goes right through the front door, past all of the, the jewelry <laughs> and out the back wall and then crashes into a, in, it crashes into another wall in the alley behind. <laughs> and of course he gets uh, stuck in, his brother takes off. And he gets stuck in the car and sent to prison. But then he's he's recruited by this cop uh, played by um, by Ramsey uh, Bedia Bedia Bedia, who is the, who's one of the he's like he plays one of the stars in uh, Call My Agent. He's one of the the clients of the of the of the agency. So I'm assuming that means he's a fairly big French actor that I just have never heard of. Uh, <laughs> he he recruits him for a a, a squad because. Uh, the the fast car crime is just taking over in Paris, and the 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 cars that the the criminals drive are way faster than anything the uh, the police have. So he he kind of puts together this secret this squad, much to the disgust and the dismay of his uh, superior. But um, he basically he gets this guy out and like tags him. Like he he wears like a electronic monitor, so he can't escape, and he becomes the the squad's mechanic. And. Uh, you know, with him, they start, they start turning the tide on the crime war. But just just before he's about to be released, uh, and he he served his sentence, uh, he kind of hooks up with his brother again, and uh, then uh, the the cop that recruits him, that's his kind of mentor, uh, gets killed, and by kind of, and he gets blamed for it. Uh, and then the chase is on. So he's he's not only trying to avoid the members of his his ex team, he's also trying to avoid the criminals, and he's trying to uh, you know save his brother's life. And you know, there's lots of kind, of, there's lots of awesome car crashes and car stunts. Yeah, and, sounds hectic. And awesome action. It's a, it was a lot of fun. I kind of like a good foreign action film because the action sometimes is so. It takes over from subtitles, you know, like they don't need to talk a lot because the action is doing all the storytelling. Well, the thing that's amazing too about this is that they have a completely different regard for human life and <laughs> and the um the, the rights of criminals. 
because in this, like, <laughs> basically the the mechanic, the way he does these cards, all he does is he like, they, yes, he increases the speed and all that sort of stuff, but he just he fortifies the shit out of the front of them. So when they're chasing a criminal on a freeway, they basically end up cornering them, and one of them will will just tackle him head on, and they'll just smash. Like there's no game of chicken. The other guy doesn't have a chance to turn away. Like <laughs> in the in the opening, in the kind of not the opening, but in the explanatory scene, he's kind of trapped between two trucks and he can't go anywhere. And the cop car smashes <laughs> right in, right into the front, and that guy is dead. Like he As is it poked, should be. And the cops do not give a fuck. As all action movies should be. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's amazing. Good Movie Monday is made possible with the support of people like Eulorium. Eulorium is a streaming platform for rare and obscure movies, and it's absolutely free. They also have a catalogue full of kids' flicks, classic movies, foreign cinema, and more. Visit Eulorium.com today to see what it's all about. Well, uh, it's no secret, I've said it many times in this episode, I did um and ah uh about my recommendations this week. I recall liking this one as a teenager and I wasn't confident that it held up. Um, but, and after I then went through about five or six, I think you convinced me to to give it a go simply by taking a photograph of your VHS and sending it to me. And so I thought, fuck it. Okay. I revisited it. And yes, my God, this one holds up really well. It's 1991 a movie called run starring Patrick Dempsey. And oh, I tell you what, and this was, this was transitional Patrick Dempsey. So he was sort of, in that stage of his career where he was between being that lanky lover boy nerd from the eighties and before he became sort of the dashing sort of bonafide <clears throat> Hollywood hunk, if you want to. I thought you were going to say word. before he became the skeezy, uh, <laughs> uh, outbreak monkey guy in, in oh, outbreak. Yeah. <laughs> like he's, he looks like he, like he, I can't tell if it's just because he's supposed to have the, uh, the, the outbreak to the virus or the he just looks like he's like a drug addict of some sort like yeah, a, I, i'm pretty sure yeah. he's, he's he's caked in makeup for that but this movie didn't actually come that long before only a few years and this is a movie that i believe should have propelled him you know to be in like some kind of new action star you know it really really is that good um the premise is pretty much a classic man on the run he plays uh, sort of a wisecracking smart ass law student and he does smart ass very well let's just say uh, very annoyingly so that you kind of want to turn the fucking movie off but it, it pays off because you know the shit gets flipped on him uh, he works in like a, a mechanics uh, workshop part-time and um, his boss sends him away to deliver a Porsche to a client in Atlantic City and naturally as stories do the car breaks down just as he gets to Atlantic City and so he drops it off for repair and then he's got a few hours to spare. So he hops into a cab and the cab driver then suggests that he goes to uh, an illegal casino. And yeah, because the cab uh, driver thinks he's loaded because he's seen yeah. him driving in that, the, driving the porch. That's right. And so this, he gets taken to this um, illegal casino. He obviously doesn't, he's not a, he's naive. He doesn't think it's an illegal casino. He just thinks he's there for a good time. And while he's there, he sort of, um, he pisses off a local mobster and they get into a bit of a scuffle and the mobster trips over, cracks his head on the bar and dies. And then suddenly this kid just out of the blue finds himself on the run, not only from the entire mafia, but the entire city is after him. So you've got every corrupt cop in town after him, uh, every, every person that's on the mob's payroll, you've got the entire community looking for him because there's a reward on his head and the news has put his photo everywhere. And so there is no escape for this kid. He is on the run. And I'll tell you what, this movie, this movie goes at such a whiplash fucking pace. It does not take a breath and it is go, go, go all the way through. And like I said, Dempsey starts out really annoying, but once he's on the run, he's fucking good. Like he's really damn good. Kelly Preston is in it. Um, it was directed by Jeff Burrows. He's a guy, the only other movie he made was um, The Man from Snowy River 2, you know, of all things. <laughs> what a bizarre claim to fame I know his direction here is fantastic and I, I read in the research it might have been IMDB or Wiki um, that he said he only took the film on uh, because of its fast paced nature it's like if you're going to make an action movie you don't stop you know you just, this is a movie that the script just moved from beat to beat to beat to beat and so that's what he did with telling it which I think is really refreshing there was actually um, a movie oh, recently or maybe sort of 10 years ago called Abduction with Taylor Lautner. Do you remember that? 
Yeah. Yeah, where he's yeah, the parkour. Was, he's like yeah. a parkour kid. Yeah, that's the one that John Singleton made before he died. And and but that takes the, the basic premise of, of run and yeah. runs with it. Yeah. So it's very similar. If you know that one, you know what to expect. Only this one's much better. But there's a there's um, a bunch about, of those. What's that one with um uh Jason Bateman where he's he, he ends up uh like hitmen come after him because his father turns state's evidence but doesn't tell him and then they his whole family disappear he goes to a party one night he comes home his whole family's disappeared and hitmen are after him and they've just deserted him i vaguely remember that and, and once again that you kind of um suggesting that there and i think there was an era of these movies where teenagers find themselves um running from very adult situations well because yeah, look, one of the other movies i was thinking about talking about was gotcha yeah, yeah, yeah. Anthony Edwards goes to Germany. Oh no, yeah, to Germany, and uh, you know, <laughs> with uh, with uh, oh, what's her name? Uh, Linda Fiorentino. <laughs> yeah, Linda Fiorentino, and uh, you know, <laughs> it crosses crosses you know crosses under the wall a couple of times and stuff, Amazing. which is super cool. So I mean, this one's easy to come by. It is on YouTube in a fairly decent quality. Um, Grab some popcorn, just give it a go. It's well worth a look. Um, hugely underrated. But I was gonna just also mention, uh, this has one of the great finales that I can think of of action movies from that era. It, and I'm not gonna spoil it at all because I do want people to check this one out. But let's just say the bad guy um meets his demise in a very creative and and appropriate way. Like they really they set up what's going to happen to him early in the film and you don't think anything of it. And then it comes around. Yeah. I don't remember how the, you're talking about the, the far, the dad, the, the mob yeah, boss. The mob boss. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember. I, that's the, it's the one part I'm, fa- I'm hazy on of this film. Yeah. It's like the last 10 minutes. Yeah. yeah. I, I remember him being taken up to the roof. Yep. To, and he's supposed to be thrown off. And yeah. the main mob boss guy is kind of on the floor below, and he just sees he sees someone fly past, and he's like, he's like, yeah, it right. And then he and sees someone else fly past, he's like, hang on a second. If I can elaborate on that moment on the roof, there is a fantastic moment where they dangle him off the roof, right? They're about to kill him, but he manages to claw his way back up, right? And this mobster falls over, and to pull himself up, he grabs the mo- the mobster's cock. Yeah. And like pulls himself up on the roof. <laughs> Fucking great. <laughs> and you'd think that's a funny moment, like, and it is very comical, but like they don't play it for laughs. Like it's sort of yeah. they know they're gonna get the laughs, but they still play it seriously and he, he's in the survival mode. Yeah. Just great. But anyway, there you go. So run, highly recommend, hope people check it out. I actually think that Patrick Dempsey's earlier career deserves a bit of a a re examination or at least a reevaluation of the way you felt about the movies at the time rather yes. than now and how it's, how he's been tainted by Grey's Anatomy. Like, you know, I mean, the ladies love him, but he's kind of, he, he like, I, you know, in all the movies that I've seen him in kind of of late, it's really put me off. Do you have a favorite of his going right back? I was always a fan of like love a boy was always good, but can't buy me love was the one for me. Can't, but yeah. Well, can't buy me love was a big one. What's the other one? The one where he's, is it love a boy? Or the woo woo kid. I think it's Lover oh, Boys. I really like. Yeah, where he's the, the kind of woo kid's great too. Woo woo kid's great. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Like he had a surprisingly strong. Yeah. Well, filmography. We can't, we can't ignore Meatballs Three. <laughs> <laughs> you can't ignore Meatballs. <laughs> That's right. The... Oh shit! Hey, we're at the end of uh, the episode. Um, before we wrap up, what I I tend to do every week is just run through some uh, titles that made my short list do you remember a movie in 94 called freefall with eric roberts and right. was it jeff Fay? no i remember deadfall with nicholas cage and sarah trigger <laughs> yeah no freefall was like it was it was um a bit like a cliffhanger type of movie but it was all set in africa and um very dtv but that was a fun one and i think what last year i mentioned the the movie last gasp with robert patrick where mm-hmm. he's like possessed by an indian sort of curse that's great that's great yeah um, yeah, and pretty much every Isaac Florentine movie deserves a, a looking. <laughs> I love the ninja, the two ninja movies he did with Scott Atkins are great. <laughs> anyway, anything, and hey, any of the early Albert Pune movies, get on it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm surprised that we didn't talk about the entire, um, 
uh, Andy Sedaris collection. <laughs> like no one, no one got decapitated by a frisbee in any of the movies that we uh, <laughs> that right. we talked about. Uh, yeah, the good thing about this show is that we'll exhaust every possible theme that we'll have to start doing part two episodes, and yeah, um, yeah we can always do this episode part two. Yeah, just fuck it. I don't care. Action movies. That's the theme. <laughs> <laughs> shit man anyway that is it that's it for another episode hey huge uh, appreciation to richard hughes um great chat hope you all enjoyed it check out that movie the enforcer it's a banger and it's it's out now on dvd it's worth a look uh thanks to the crew jared guillermo joe chad and james and also uh thanks to chloe you can see her alongside myself on wednesday nights up late videos they're a lot of fun and they're getting more fun i tell you what we're getting a little bit loose on those uh ben do you have anything to say before we sign off uh no i just just, you know, head out, head to uh, monsterfest.com.au slash Australia and check out the Monsterfest program if you're in Melbourne. If you're uh, interstate, then that will that will be up soon. The, the, the interstate programs will be announced very soon. There's some cracking films in, in the program, including the new one from Jason Eisner, the uh, guy who directed Hobo with a Shotgun, and his movie is fucking insane and awesome. There's a, there's, there's a great film called Lockdown Tower, it's a French. It's a French film. It's bleak as fuck. Like shockingly <laughs> dark. But like I could not. Like I put it on. I initially just kind of was like, oh, I'll put it on in the background while I'm working. I forgot about work about two minutes in. <laughs> and just got sucked in. It's great. You um you you missed your calling, mate. You should be a spruker as a profession. <laughs> <laughs> I endorse everything you said and everyone should get to the Monster, Monster Fest website. Hey, we're going to sign off with a song called All Woman by Mark Ferrari. This is from a movie called Codename Silencer, a.k.a. Body Count, starring Robert Darby, Bridget Nelson, Nielsen, and Sonny Chiba. That's a bit of a cast for you there, Ben. Yeah, right. What's it, what's, <laughs> so it's Robert Darby, Sonny Chiba, and who? Bridget Nielsen. There's so many good ones. What's the one with Robert Darby and Rowdy Roddy Piper and uh, your favorite um, Andrew Dice Clay, where there it's like Die Hard, but it's on the top floor of the building. There's a beauty pageant and Shannon Tweed. <laughs> I think it's Shannon Tweed is the yeah. The I have it in my and she and she, I have the image in my head. She's the one who has to, who gets the revenge. Who like who's the John McClane character? Yeah, I can't remember the name of that. You may as well look it up so we don't leave people hanging. <laughs> That'd be a, what a cliffhanger of an episode. <laughs> yeah, what is it? Do, 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 you better hurry up because Mark Ferrari's waiting, mate. Fuck, Robert Darby's made a lot of films. He's do, just directed do, one. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The list. The less said about that, the better. <laughs> uh, uh, is it? I believe it's called No Contest. Is the name of the film? Yeah, and it is Shannon Tweed. And who else is in it? Uh, Rowdy Roddy Piper. Uh, Polly <laughs> Shannon. Polly Shannon from uh, um, Patriot Games. Uh, Chandra West from uh, one of the. I can never remember which, which. Uh, uh, Universal Soldier she's from. Um, but it was made 1995, so exactly the same year as Codename Silence. Well, that was worth a wait. Yeah. <laughs> See you next week, mate. See ya.
Oh